Dota 2 is difficult. It takes a lot of practice and learning to even be able to play, and hundreds if not thousands of hours to become good. But for a few, just being good isn't good enough. They strive to be the best. A strong competitive mindset and character are required for someone to become good enough to play at the international. And among those few, an even smaller number aim to be the best at what is hardest. There's a lengthy debate to be had about which Dota hero is most difficult to play, but Meepo will always make the list. A character so unique and complex that even decade-long veterans stay away from him. Today, we will explore the competitive history and performance of Dota 2's most difficult hero at the game's most important events, the International Tournament Series. So, how good was Meepo, the Geomancer? The story of Meepo is sponsored and brought to you by Honkai Star Rail. Honkai Star Rail is a multi-platform space fantasy RPG from Hoyoverse. The game is a turn-based space adventure in which you explore different worlds across a vast universe full of interesting characters and curious misadventures. Honkai just released update 1.5, which introduces a whole new storyline in Biloborg and two new limited time 5-star characters. First, we have Huhu. She is an introverted character haunted by some kind of ghost? Demon? Spirit? Uh, he has taken on the role of her companion, or bully, and or guardian. He's also her tail. I have to say, the specifics of this character elude me a little bit, but I think that's a good thing. It makes everything a lot more interesting. Another new character who is a bit more straightforward is Argenti. Argenti is your classic noble knight. He is all about powerful AoE attacks with his spear, but what stands out most about him are his wonderful aesthetics. In particular during his trailer that I'm currently showing. Just incredible. Great job by the art team and editors on that one. All this and even more stories, new and returning characters and a new map are waiting for you in Honkai Star Rail Update 1.5. There's a link down in the description to Honkai Star Rail and a code that you can use to redeem 50 Stellar Jade. Thank you very much to Honkai Star Rail for sponsoring this video. Meepo borrowed his way into Dota 2 in late September 2012, shortly after the International 2. He was a melee agility hero with awful attributes across the board. Only his starting armor and night vision were above average. Meepo was a very unique hero, and to properly make sense of his abilities, we first have to look at his ultimate. Meepo's ultimate was Divided We Stand. Divided We Stand was a passive ability that permanently summoned an additional Meepo as soon as it was leveled, and then again for each additional level. Going forward, I will refer to the original Meepo as Meepo Prime. The additional Meepos were near-perfect replicates of Meepo Prime. They dealt and took full damage and shared all of his abilities, which they could use fully and independently. Despite the clones being considered full heroes, only Meepo Prime could carry items. While his boots would be automatically shared to all of the other Meepos, they couldn't get any other items. They did however gain 100% of Meepo Prime's base attributes and 25% of any bonus attributes he had. Bonus attributes being additional strength, agility or intelligence that Meepo gained from his items and not just from leveling up. The clones also had the unique property of being considered full heroes for the purposes of experience sharing. Usually when something died and gave experience, that experience would be shared evenly among all nearby opposing heroes. But Meepo gained a full share for each Meepo in experience range. To give a practical example of this, four heroes ganked one of their opponents. 
the opposing hero died, giving out 1000 total experience. This was then shared among the four heroes, each gaining 250 experience. But if one of the four heroes was Meepo Prime and two of his clones, then Dota considered all three of those Meepos worthy of the same amount of experience as the other three heroes. Meepo then gained 50% of the total experience, while the remaining 50% were split between his teammates. 500 for Meepo and 167 for each of the other heroes. Meepo soaked up experience like a sponge meaning he leveled up incredibly quickly, but he stole that experience from his team. A fun side effect of the Meepo clones being considered full heroes was that when Meepo picked up a double damage rune, it would apply to all Meepos, not just Meepo Prime. Although only Meepo Prime was able to pick up runes. Finally, and most importantly, if any Meepo died, they all did. Killing one Meepo killed every Meepo. Divided We Stand also had an Aghanim Scepter upgrade that spawned an additional Meepo. Divided We Stand was, and still is, one of the most unique abilities in Dota. Playing Meepo meant playing multiple characters, which made the hero significantly more difficult to play, especially in the context of Dota 2, a game that doesn't feature much micromanagement. Meepo's first regular ability was Earthbind. Earthbind tossed the net at the target location, rooting any enemies hit by it for 2 seconds. While Earthbind was traveling, it provided significant flying vision that lingered for over 3 seconds. This made it a strong tool for scouting out areas, without needing to commit into them. Earthbind had unusual scaling, centered entirely around its cooldown decreasing and its cast range increasing. At level 4, Earthbind had an incredible 1250 cast range, but at level 1, it was only a lackluster 500. Earthbind didn't do much by itself, but because each Meepo could use Earthbind independently from each other, Meepo was capable of locking a target down for a fairly lengthy period of time, which gave him a good opportunity to connect with attacks. Meepo's second ability was Poof. Poof was a ground target ability with a lengthy cast point of 1.5 seconds, after which the Meepo casting Poof teleported to the Meepo closest to the target location, dealing damage at both the departure and arrival locations. Poof could be used to teleport from and to anywhere on the map, as long as the Meepo was already in that location. Poof was a fantastic ability that did solid damage and gave Meepo a global presence. One Meepo could be reinforced by the whole gang in seconds, which also often resulted in significant damage. Despite its tooltip claiming otherwise to this very day, Meepo's Poof was, and is not, a channeled ability. Instead it had a long cast point, which meant Meepo could start and interrupt the ability without it going on cooldown or using mana. This long cast point was Poof's weakest aspect, as it was easy to simply walk away from Poof if Meepo hadn't disabled his target with Earthbind first. An important nuance with Poof was that it was a ground target ability. The way it worked was that the Meepo player would click on a location and then the poofing Meepo would teleport to the Meepo closest to that location. Which Meepo that was, was only decided when Poof finished casting. The reason this was important is because it allowed the Meepo player to plan their movement with less micromanagement. For example, if Meepo Prime had a blink dagger, then all of the other Meepos could start poofing loosely into his direction, often done just via the minimap. And then shortly before they finished, Meepo Prime blinked in and dealt massive burst damage. Meepo's third and final regular ability was Geostrike. Geostrike was a passive that applied a debuff for 2 seconds that slowed and dealt damage. Multiple Geostrike debuffs could be applied on the same target from different Meepos at the same time. Once 4 or 5 Meepos were attacking a hero, that hero had an incredibly difficult time escaping. 
especially when considering that Geostrike bypassed magic immunity. However, when only one or two Meepos were applying Geostrike, it wasn't particularly powerful, as its slow and damage were minimal by itself, especially if the ability hadn't been maxed out yet. Overall, Meepo's abilities were fairly simple and low on impact when used individually. Meepo relied on his ultimate to get effective use out of them. One Earthbind or Poof didn't do much, but four of them quickly overwhelmed anyone. When he managed to catch a target in a good position, his damage was nothing short of amazing. But Meepo also came with the significant downside of being a massive target that was quite easy to kill. Meepo Prime was capable of tanking up, but the other Meepos could never reach average health thresholds. Now, and I apologize for this, we're gonna have to go on a little bit of a tangent here. I always make an effort to use the proper pronouns for each hero. Because I invest hundreds of hours into writing and researching these videos, and I don't want to get something basic like that wrong. Meepo is a male character, and his pronouns, as shown in his tooltips, are male pronouns, which is why I've been using them so far. However, <laughs> the Why Did We Stand introduces a bit of a complication. Is Meepo one character split into five, meaning one entity that we should refer to in the singular? Or are Meepo multiple characters as one, and we should refer to them in the plural? The Why Did We Stand refers to Meepo's clones as imperfect, semi-autonomous duplicates of himself. And the About page for Meepo mentions that Meepo gathers his cells both of which heavily imply that Meepo is one individual with multiple bodies. His self-introductory lore text also supports this, as it explains that as he was handling a vague magic crystal, it exploded and split his soul into pieces. But the lore text for the Divided We Stand card in Artifact, which is canon, has Meepo talking about how it's important to have friends that can compensate for your weaknesses. And that, for example, Meepo 2 is great at playing dice, while the narrator, presumably Meepo 1, is better at cards. Within that text, Meepo also keeps referring to the groups of Meepos as V, meaning plural. The lore description for the Meepo card also has Meepo referring to a Meepo free that they handed over as collateral and refers to the group of Meepos as we while referring to the individual narrator Meepo as I. Although that is a bit up to interpretation as Meepo is freely swapping between I and we pronouns throughout the entire text. Also, in his responses to purchasing an Aghanim Scepter in Dota 2, Meepo sometimes gets surprised by another Meepo. Ah, set it! Wait, where did you come from? All of this implies that each Meepo is an individual being. Still, when one Meepo dies, they all do. They are clearly not fully independent. Or are they? In the Under Hollow event game mode that Valve released with the 2018 Battle Pass, there is a character that can be found called the Lost Meepo, who lives in the Underhollow and makes a living as a shopkeeper. Now, it isn't clear if the Lost Meepo is fully independent from the other Meepos, but it sure seems implied? Unfortunately, Meepo wasn't a playable character in the Underhollow, so we don't know how they would have interacted. As I was driving myself mad going down this rabbit hole, I eventually wondered if they were real-world analogs to this situation, and it turns out, kinda? Alien Hand Syndrome is a rare but a real condition in which a patient loses control over one of their limbs. For example, their right hand might reach for something, but then their left hand stops them from doing so. This has been best documented in people who had the two hemispheres of their brain split. Now. There doesn't seem to be clear consensus on if we truly have two consciousnesses in our brains, but there certainly seems to be a split responsibility between the two hemispheres. At this point, I was in way too deep, and I asked my wife, who is currently in medical school, and she responded with, 
What are you talking about? Which wasn't particularly helpful, but after about 15 minutes of explaining, she went and helped me with some additional research. After reading the 2012 research paper, the myth of dual consciousnesses in the split brain, contrary evidence from psychology and neuroscience by Gonzalo Muneva, it seems to be that the two halves are both conscious, but at different times for different tasks. However, the research here is not conclusive and still developing. Relevant for us is that split brain people and those experiencing alien hand syndrome don't usually appear to think of themselves as multiple people, but can sometimes feel disconnected from the limb in a way that makes them think it's not part of their own body. The research material I found on this particular question was quite minimal. I got the impression that most medical journals were only interested in how and why the body did what it did and not at all in how this made the patient feel or what their own interpretation of their situation was. Which is a bit depressing, but I feel like we're going into a way different direction now and I honestly don't think this has made things more clear. Okay, Meepo. My understanding is that Meepo is one being split into multiple. As all the Meepos are dependent on each other and they all die if one of them does. They also always seem to act as a group and they haven't given each other proper names, instead simply assigning themselves numbers. Clearly, individual identity isn't a priority for them. Now, the lost Meepo doesn't make any sense no matter how we think about it. So my guess is that it is somehow possible for the Meepos to become independent from the group, but the exact mechanisms of that are unexplained and mysterious. Now, I haven't brought this up yet, but Meepo is also just a bit of a weird guy. And it wouldn't be out of character for Meepo to be talking about himself in the plural. So, here's my conclusion. I believe Meepo is one individual split into multiple bodies, but he has slightly dissociated himself from those bodies, thinking of them as somewhat individuals, but also considering himself a group. Because of this, I am going to refer to Meepo in the singular he. And I'm going to ignore the 12 year old tooltip for poof that uses the it pronoun as that's the only time it is used in reference to Meepo, and I will assume that it's a typo that's been in the game for 12 years because Valve don't ever clean up their tooltips, which is also why that same tooltip still says that Poof is a channel despite it never being a channel, and also why Book of the Dead references Necronomicon level 3 summons, which haven't been in the game for well over a year. I'm also 100% confident that I've now given this more time and effort than anybody at Valve ever did. So let's just move on before I go completely mad. Leading into the International 2013, Meepo received a variety of buffs. Divided We Stand had its stat sharing percentage increased to 30 by default and the Aghanim Scepter now increased it further to 100%. This made Aghanim Scepter a mandatory item on Meepo. Poof had its cooldown reduced and Geostrike its damage increased. Simple buffs, but nice to have. In a curious change, Meepo had his innate magic resistance increased from the standard 25% to 35%. This made him a good bit more resilient to spells while requiring no effort from his side. The only nerf Meepo received was to Earthbind, which had its 800 flying vision reduced to 300 and its vision linger removed. This was actually a fairly significant nerf and made Earthbind not really viable as a scouting tool anymore. Unfortunately, Meepo was not picked for any games at the International Free. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why. There were multiple reasons that made him difficult to justify. He was squishy but soaked up a ton of experience, which meant that he took that experience away from other carries while being easy to kill, making him a risky all-in character. Meepo was undeniably strong if he lived, but if he didn't, then his team was left with nothing. Another problem was that Meepo desperately needed his ultimate to do anything. If he didn't have clones to rely upon, then all of his basic abilities were just bad. 
they were balanced around the idea of using them with 3 to 4 heroes, but until level 6 there was just one sad meepo that couldn't really do anything. While he leveled up quickly once he had his ultimate, without it he was just a pathetic hero with bad abilities and worse stats. Laning was impossible for him and so there was no point in trying. This last problem was addressed significantly after TI3. Usually, heroes could level their ultimates at level 6, 11 and 16. Divided we stand was changed to become available at levels 3, 10 and 17. It also gained a property that reduced Meepo's respawn times by upwards of 30%. Both these changes were fantastic for Meepo and after receiving some other minor changes to various attributes, Meepo seemed ready for the International 2014. Hello friends, thank you very much for watching the video, don't worry, we'll continue in a moment. But first, I want to remind you to leave a thumbs up on the video. That's really important, please do actually do that. I know you hear that all the time, but it genuinely makes a difference. And with a channel like ours, where we can only make one video a month because they take so long to make, you know, we really need to make that video count. So if you want to support us, please, please give the video a thumbs up. And if you really want to support us, consider becoming a channel member. That way we have a certain baseline of guaranteed income, which is, you know, pretty important because we gotta eat. Gotta eat. Anyway, let's get back to Meepo. Meepo was a strange character that demanded unusual skills from his players. While other micromanagement-based characters like Chen or Naga Siren existed, none of them pushed the concept as far as Meepo did. If Chen made a mistake, then his creeps died and he was severely weakened for the rest of the fight. But if Meepo left even one of his clones out of position, then he was dead. The sheer death of all Meepos left no room for mistakes. To play Meepo at the International, his players had to be experts at micromanaging, and that was a skill that didn't transfer well to other characters. Meepo required passion, and the fire for Meepo burned brightest in one player. Cloud9's Sing Sing. Sing Sing was and is a popular streamer. At the time, he had a stable team that stuck together but for a long time they couldn't find the support they needed and a sponsorship that suited them. They saw little to no tier 1 tournament success until they joined Cloud9 in 2014. From that point on, they quickly established themselves as a team to be taken seriously and Sing Sing earned a reputation for his fantastic Meepo play. Meepo was only chosen in 4 games at the International 2014 and three of them came from Sing Sing. He always took the Geomancer mid, which was an unfortunate necessity because Meepo needed fast levels. Meepo by himself wasn't a strong laner by any means, especially during the very early moments of a game. While Poof was a powerful nuke, its small radius made it difficult to hit opposing heroes that had any sort of significant range. At levels 1 and 2, Meepo often struggled to even get close enough for last hitting. But as soon as he hit level 3, everything changed when Meepo's first clone arrived. This clone represented a huge additional threat in the lane, as Meepo's power quite literally doubled. While harassing one Meepo out of lane wasn't particularly difficult, doing the same to two of them was seemingly impossible. Attack one and the other swings back get one to low health and he walks back to base while the other takes over the lane. Leave them alone and then one Meepo farms the mid while the other stacks the jungle. Meepo's split nature allowed him to occupy space in the mid lane like no other hero could. Unless Meepo was completely dominated in lane, there was no way to stop him from farming. And even if such an impossible task was somehow accomplished, Meepo was a great hero for dual laning mid after he reached level 3. Usually, mid dual lanes suffered from having to split experience between two heroes, which defeated the whole purpose of sending a hero solo mid as those heroes were meant to level up quickly. 
But Meepo's unique experience stealing property made it so that even in a dual mid lane, he still gained two thirds the experience. All of this combined with Pooh's high damage when landing both the teleport and the rival hits gave Meepo one of the highest farming speeds in the entire game. His skill build was optimized for farming as well, getting only two points into Earthbind before maxing out Poof as quickly as possible. Only afterwards did Sing Sing opt for Geostrike, as it wasn't a very effective ability while he didn't have too many meeples yet. With all this money, he rushed two items, Aghanim Scepter and Blink Dagger. Aghanim Scepter was a must-buy on Meeple. It would already have been fantastic if all it did was grant an additional meeple, but it also strengthened all the clones substantially and made them actually scale with items. Blink Dagger was then used to give Meepo some much needed mobility. Blink initiating and then following up by poofing in the whole squad was huge burst damage and difficult to escape from. And once Meepo's opponents had enough gold for a BKB to help protect themselves from poof, Geostrike was usually fully leveled up, and since it bypassed that protection, Meepo could then even kill magic immune heroes. Meepo was usually the top performing hero on his team, easily leading the net worth and experience charts. He was a tremendous threat that overpowered nearly anyone in a direct confrontation. But that strength came at a cost. Meepo siphoned tons and tons of gold and experience from his team. There were two styles of Dota that existed at the International Four. The classic tri-lane dual carry team composition and hyper-aggressive pushing strategies. Meepo didn't really fit into either approach. Classic tri-lanes relied on farming up two carries, but Meepo stole all the gold and experience from his team. The gold because he farmed so efficiently in all lanes that there simply weren't any creeps left to take and the experience because of his split experience mechanics. There simply weren't enough resources left to support a second carry, which is why Cloud9 always paired Meepo with Doom, a hero that could generate his own gold independent from whether or not there were creeps available. Now some might argue that Meepo should have just left some gold for his team, but then he wouldn't have been strong and there was nothing he could do about the experience mechanics. And if it came to the other style, all in pushing, Meepo was simply too slow to fit. Those kinds of teams wanted to end the game by 15 minutes and Meepo needed that time to farm Aghanim's Scepter. Meepo required a huge commitment from his team. There was no such thing as a casual Meepo pick. The hero provided huge power but starved his team. This also made him a massive target in fights. Since so many resources were invested into Meepo, he was always the focal point. But for that exact same reason, Meepo was strong. He needed to carry fights by himself. And he could do that. Синга приходит Тайт Хантер, попадает в Кор Смэш, но тут пуфики, пуфики, минус 2. Это минус 3 в размен минус 2. Финнери тоже умрет, это будет минус 4. Финнери толкает себя. Стан через 6 секунд. Заморозит всех. Сейчас попадает. будет стан, сейчас будет стан, но тут трек. Финрир ничего не может сделать. Макропира, не будет ли стан? Нет маны, нет маны, ничего не может сделать. Синг, Синг, очередной фраг и сетка по Эфаю. И трек по Эфаю, это просто очередной вайп в исполнении Клауд Найн. Красная вся команда, которая вот бежала, бежала. Not only was Meepo strong, but he also seemed to have a really good matchup into the hyper-aggressive pushing strategies. Those kinds of teams grouped up really early and then started breaking down towers methodically, one after another without slowing down. They often started a push at tier 1 towers that ended at the barracks. Most teams struggled against these kinds of strategies because the only way to defend from such pushes was to take early teamfights. But if a draft didn't allow for that, then the only other thing they could try to do was counter push, but that was extremely risky. Meepo had an unmatched global map presence. While heroes like Nature's Prophet may have seemed like they were in two places at the same time, Meepo literally was in two places at the same time. 
This made it possible for him to be ready and in position to take a fight, which by itself already slowed down the push, and then at the same time counter push and farm. Both LGD and VG Gaming tried pushing strategies against Cloud9's Meepo, and they both came up short. While their pushes looked to be overwhelming, at no point did they actually manage to build a lead over Meepo. And even when they killed him, he was able to come back well in time to continue defending due to his faster respawn times. Intuitively, I assumed that Meepo's weakness would be aggressive, fast-paced games, but he actually did incredibly well in those. No, his kills here were long, drawn-out matches. When Team DK played against Cloud9, DK slowed the game down to a crawl and turned it into a 70-minute farming match. While Meepo still did well early, he eventually stopped growing. His item build necessitated Blink Dagger and Aghanim Scepter, but neither offered late-game stats. Eventually, the opposing Naga Siren just overwhelmed him, and then the fact that he siphoned so many resources from his team became a devastating weakness. While Meepo was still strong, there wasn't anyone to back him up. His twisted fate left him all alone. At the International 2014, Meepo was a legitimately powerful hero that could carry games all by himself. However, he was difficult and risky to play. Only two teams dared pick him, and only one did so multiple times. Meepo was a special hero, and so win rate and pick rate don't paint a good picture here. From my observations, Meepo was very dangerous, and if more players had practiced him, he would have seen much wider usage. But Meepo required such a specific, non-transferable skill set that I assume most teams just didn't think he was worth the trouble. They were wrong. When Sing Sing played him, he showed that Meepo was the real deal and needed to be respected. Meepo only received a few changes after TI4. Divided We Stand no longer provided respawn time reduction, Geostrike had its damage slightly improved, and Earthbind and Poof no longer ignored Ancient Creeps. Not a lot of changes, but the respawn time reduction nerf was fairly significant. Since Meepo was the most important hero on his team, having to wait longer for him to respawn when something went wrong certainly hurt. More important than hero-specific changes though, was that Dota's entire economy was reworked. The bounty for hero kills now scaled with the net worth of the killed hero, which made the hyper-focused approach of Meepo teams much worse. A team could be losing, but their Meepo would still be worth a high bounty because so many resources were centered on him. The risk involved with playing Meepo became even higher. Meepo was not played at the International 5. Sing Sing wasn't competing and no other team was willing to take the chance. After TI5, Meepo saw no significant changes again. His base damage was increased by 4 and Geostrike had its damage increased again. Double damage runes also no longer applied to all Meepos. At the International 2016, Meepo was only picked for a single game. This pick came from a player that we're going to hear a lot more from going forward. DC's Wii. Wii was a relatively new player to the scene, who, despite middling results, had gained notoriety for his excellent performance in the mid. He was the kind of player that shined even when his team lost the game. Wii was also the first player to reach 8000 MMR. Wii bounced between a couple of teams before finally joining Digital Chaos for the International 2016. He took Meepo into the mid and there he did well, even finding an early kill. Like we had seen before, V used Meepo's split presence to farm and quickly became top net worth. The early game was looking great for DC. But then, disaster struck. Ehome set a trap for DC and managed to catch them by surprise. Running in circles, but it's like, hey guys, I found them! I found them! He goes on a lot and the Blade Fury will fall up. Here comes the Earthbind Lanham. It gets disrupted now. Poof only, I think one went off there for Meepo. Now jumping. Call coming out. On 11 gets one shot. Can he get two? He misses. No, he gets the second onto the Meepo. Look Three the dead. That was an amazing call. And Resolution will be the fourth to go down. E-home. 
In this fight, we see the main reason why Meepo could not be played at the International 6. Axe Axe was a melee strength hero that excelled at brawling and had the Counter Helix passive ability. Counter Helix gave Axe a 20% chance to deal significant damage in an AoE around himself whenever he was attacked. Counter Helix had recently been buffed and TI6 was the first time Axe was in the spotlight at a tournament. He saw frequent use and performed well. Meepo got destroyed by Axe. Counter Helix was devastating for Meepo to go up against as he couldn't attack him without triggering the ability constantly. Worst of all, Axe could force Meepo to attack. It was an incredibly one-sided hero matchup and if an Axe was in the game, Meepo shouldn't be. DC learned this lesson the hard way. Everything went south as Meepo tried to solo Roshan, but then they got caught and Ehome stole the kill. Ehome snowballed the game from there, ending it in 34 minutes. Because of his already low popularity paired with bad hero matchups, Meepo was not picked again. After the International 6, Dota 7.0 was released. 7.0 reworked lots of things, including the leveling structure for most heroes, but Meepo's remained unchanged. Meepo also gained talents, most of which were unfortunately unimpressive. Still, at least all of his clones fully benefited from his talents. Much more importantly, Meepo's clones now always fully shared his attributes even without Aghanim Scepter. They also became able to pick up runes. These were massive buffs. The clones became significantly stronger at a baseline level and scaled quicker with Meepo's items. This meant he no longer had to rush Aghanim's scepter. The rune pickup buff was also quite impactful as it gave Meepo even more flexibility when occupying the space in the mid. It was also noteworthy that more bounty runes had been added with 7.0, which the clones could now pick up. These buffs were so good that Meepo even received a nerf having his base armor reduced a bit in a following patch. In January 2016, the player Abed was scouted by Execration. Only a couple months later, Abed went 18-0 on Meepo at the International 2016 Wildcard Qualifier. In June 2017, he became the first player to reach 10,000 MMR, making him the highest ranked player in the world. Abed was a Meepo specialist. He joined Digital Chaos for the International 7. Abed was widely respected by the pro community and as a result, Meepo was constantly banned against DC. They didn't get a chance to show off Meepo until the second round of the main event. But in DC's match against LGD, Abed was finally given his signature hero. As is tradition, he took Meepo mid. A lane in which he immediately fell behind, as Meepo was still a weak laner during the early levels. But as Mirana left the lane to gank, Abed caught up quickly by farming the jungle, securing runes and taking lane creeps. A big deviation from before was that Abed didn't rush Aghanim's scepter anymore. Instead, he went for a couple of wraith bands and then a diffusal blade. Aghanim's Scepter had always had rather poor stats for its cost because most of its strength came from the ability upgrades it provided. By going for more cost-effective items, Meepo became powerful more quickly. In no time at all, Meepo was ahead in net worth, becoming the most farmed hero on the map. But LGD knew that this was going to happen and they had planned for it. They took an early Roshan and then at only 19 minutes moved for the mid barracks. DC were not ready to fight this early. Chaos Knight overwhelmed Meepo easily and then the barracks fell. From here, the Radiant simply kept up the pressure and won in only 22 minutes. Meepo never even got a chance to play. His resource absorption was also incredibly noticeable in this game. While Meepo was level 20, the highest in the game, the second highest on his team was only level 13 and Dubo on Dazzle finished the game at level 8. On the other side, Mirana was level 18, Chaos Knight level 16 and Magnus level 15, a much more even distribution giving the entire team fighting strength. LGD made Meepo play for them. 
and DC were knocked out of the tournament in the following game. Mipo's only match at the International 7 was a disaster. But overall, he still got banned 10 times, which was quite respectable. Despite what most would consider a lackluster performance, Mipo wasn't changed much after TI7. His talents got reworked, but remained largely unremarkable, and Earthbind was mildly buffed. He also lost his innately higher magic resistance, which was normalized to the standard 25%, but in turn, Meepo gained a total of 4 additional base armor. Over the years, Meepo had gained a lot of notoriety as the hero to master for players that wanted to show off how good they were. The 4 additional base armor Meepo had gained recently also put him into a quite powerful spot from a balanced perspective. And so he became more and more popular leading up into the International 8. Pain Gaming, Team Secret, Vici Gaming, Fnatic, and TNC Predator all had a Meepo player on their team. It was common knowledge that if Meepo got a chance to shine, he was devastatingly strong. Meepo might not have been meta, but he was terrifying. Meepo was banned 20 times at the International 8. The majority of those bans were aimed at two players, Abed and Ace. Ace was an old school player who had been part of the competitive Dota 2 scene since 2012. He played for many teams in his long career, usually being at either the very top of tier 2 or very bottom of tier 1. But in late 2017, Ace was recruited by Team Secret and truly hit his stride. With an only a couple of months, Ace took home his first Tier 1 tournament victory at Dream League Season 8 and became a mainstay at Tier 1 tournaments, including the International. In fear of Abed and Ace's prowess with the hero, Meepo was only allowed to be picked for three games. In those three games, Meepo continued his evolution away from Aghanim's Scepter. By purchasing multiple early wave bands along with his power threats, Meepo was able to become strong quickly, which sped up his farming and made his laning stage much safer. For the first time, Meepo was being played outside of the mid lane. While Meepo mid was great at securing his own farm, he applied basically no pressure on the opposing mid and left them to become strong. By moving Meepo into the safe lane, teams could then send a powerful laner who was better at securing space for their team into the mid. Meepo in a dual lane still got a lot of levels, as he simply stole all of the experience from his support and it wasn't as important that he couldn't apply pressure himself as he had a support to do that for him. Then Meepo farmed and he went for a combination of free items. Ethereal Blade, which gave him massive stats along with a powerful active effect that gave Meepo even more burst damage and synergized nicely with Poof, Blink Dagger, which let him get close to his opponents, and Manta Style, which allowed him to summon illusions of himself. Meepo had a unique interaction with illusions. Poof allowed Meepo to teleport to any allied Meepo. Illusions were allied Meepos, and hence Meepo could poof to illusions. Manta Star provided Meepo with incredible utility, as he could use the expendable illusions for movements that he wouldn't want to risk a real Meepo for. It made pushing against Meepo extremely difficult, as he could first poke a creep wave with the illusions to make sure it's safe, and then poof in Meepos afterwards to easily clear the wave. Meepo illusions were also threatening in teamfights because they always represented the entire Meepo power squad. He could send in illusions as a fight was starting, get them into a good position and then follow it up with a powerful burst of poof. Meepo's strengths had become more and more visible now that he could buy proper items and wasn't forced into Aghanim's Scepter. His pushing speed was also excellent and his map control unmatched. Talents were also a blessing for Meepo as he could get to level 25 very quickly. Even the resource training had become a bit less of an issue as more resources were available and Roshan became a more frequent fixture of games. Meepo was great at killing Roshan and got a lot of use out of Aegis of the Immortal. Roshan was just another way amongst many that Meepo could build an advantage. 
This may sound like a strange thing to say about a hero that was only picked three times, but at the International 2018, Meepo was excellent. He performed incredibly well in all three games that he played and his players were widely respected. Like before, the biggest things holding Meepo back made that he was really hard to play and that he siphoned significant resources from his team. But the teams that managed to deal with these problems were handsomely rewarded. The second problem was addressed in patch 7.20. Meepo's experience sharing was reworked. Clones were now considered only half a real hero. If a clone was next to an ally, the ally would get 75% of the experience and the clone 25%. Meepo Prime still received the full share and if no allied heroes were near a clone, that clone would also receive the full experience. This change was great for Meepo and the teams that wanted to pick him. He still gained more experience than other heroes and he still leveled up quickly through split farming, but he no longer drained all of his teammates' earned experience during fights. Also included in 7.20 was a change to his passive. Geostrike was removed and replaced with Ransack. Ransack was a passive ability that gave Meepo and all of his clones the ability to steal health from his opponents whenever he attacked. Each Meepo would deal bonus damage on each attack and then heal all Meepos for that same amount. The damage dealt was pure damage, so the ability offered a continued way to pierce magic immunity. Ransack did less damage than Geostrike used to, but it provided significant staying power through healing to Meepo, something the hero had always struggled with. These reworks were quite powerful, and so Meepo was nerfed multiple times in the following patches, having various damage numbers and attributes slightly reduced. The experience sharing for Divided We Stand was also reduced to 40%, which was a nerf, as the 50% from before was a really nice value to be at. All of these changes then meant Meepo was a bit weak, so a bunch of his general attributes were buffed again. Particularly his talents were improved, gaining plus 10 strength at level 10 and plus 20% evasion at level 15. An important quirk that had come along with talents was that Meepo could have his clones benefit from them twice. This only applied to simple strength, agility or intelligence boosts and so it hadn't been relevant until now, when Meepo gained a powerful bonus strength talent. The way this worked was that all Meepos benefit from their talents, but Meepo Prime also shared his attributes with his clones. So a Meepo clone gained plus 10 strength from his talent and then an additional 10 strength from the shared attributes from Meepo Prime. The same principle also applied to power threats, as Meepo clones had their own version of the boots and also shared the attributes of Meepo Prime. This all meant that often Meepo clones were actually a bit stronger than Meepo Prime. Also during this period, the consumable Aghanim Scepter was added, as well as its drop from the third Roshan. Meepo was already great at killing Roshan often and early, and he still had a powerful Aghanim Scepter effect. This environmental change was certainly promising for his late game options. Similarly, the addition of a dedicated inventory slot for TP scrolls worked wonders for Meepo at all stages of the game. Meepo always wanted to have a full inventory of stat-giving items to maintain an appropriate power level. With the addition of the dedicated TP scroll slot and the backpack, Meepo was now always able to carry 6 proper items. The International 2019 was the year of Meepo. Abed, Ace and V were ready. All of Meepo's defenders had assembled and were looking more powerful than ever. Meepo returned to the mid lane and continued his classic approach of a passive farming carry that occupied massive amounts of space on the map. Ransack had made Meepo even better at farming, as even a single point into it gave him significant sustain that allowed him to jungle freely without needing to worry about healing back at the base. But as before, this playstyle came with significant downsides. Meepo's tendency to ignore his opposing mid was made very visible during NIP vs Infamous, as both Meepo and Broodmother surpassed the other hero's farm by over 2,000 gold at only 12 minutes. 
giving away free farm like this was a risky gamble to make. And while it worked out in this game, during Fnatic vs Infamous, the enemy slog who was left alone ultimately ended up carrying the game and destroyed Meepo. Something similar also happened during Mineski vs Secret, when Alchemist used the space given to him by Meepo to completely snowball out of control. However, as that game was winding down, Meepo managed to show why that risk was worth it. I mean, this heavenly grazed alchemist, don't forget, it gives you 28 bonus strength. That's just damage that he's going to throw into these buildings. And there we go. Look at him just so impressed. Focusing on the melee barracks, the rest of the secret, looking for anybody to be able to go to. But move, but move, takes that opportunity to turn and finish off Nisha. Instant buyback, puppy in trouble, the mouth is going to take him out inside. He doesn't want to extend himself, he knows. Megas is the focus, Moon looking to be able to finish off that range rack. He should be able to get this time, the vice goes off. Defensive force tap, Moon going back in with the BKB, trying to get this people. Unstable concoction, locking them all down, focusing the one with the soul, the arrow. And force tap does manage to get a point, but the arrow nail with the other people. That's going to finish off. A buyback coming out from Secret. Now they have to hold prey that Vanessa. Will feed their lives away off of the greater good, but no, it's gonna be the arrow coming out on Denisha. Controlled up, great paralyzed and cast. Nico baby trying to finish him off. That's gonna be his first life. Second life coming up for him and the Alchemist. Unstable concoction, ready to go. On the meatballs, controlling them up. KP protecting with the heavenly grace. Look at him just beating down those poor little dwarves. They're gonna die soon, Moon. He may also fall though. He's been looking to survive. The Star Storm not quite enough. The Scythe on the Elk is actually gonna live through this. Nico baby, he's controlled up as well. Big one. He survives through it all, Mineski, they die, and they don't have buyback on the Alchemist, they have buyback on everybody else. This AP can still buy back, Nico baby, he's gonna make his jump forward, he does have those extra lives, but he's probably gonna need it for the Omni Knight, he dies so fast, and turn it up, KP buys back with just 5 seconds left in the clock, can he get there in time, can he actually save Nico baby, he's gonna pop his BKB, Rage of Hand Hill going forward, instantly gets controlled up, but does have the old scepter, another leap away, they're trying to finish him off, heals coming out, KP can't provide enough, goes the Ethereum Blade, finish him off, now they might be able to chop down this building faster, faster, Rage of Hand Hill, they're trying to go for it, they jump in, the last stage ever to be able to finish off Big One Beepo, but he's Meepo was still always the clear focal point of his team. During NIP vs Infamous, Fata playing a position 1 Wraith King went for a very defensive item build, opting for Pipe of Insight first over any damage items. This defensive build worked great as it kept Meepo alive and enabled him. Because of Ransack, onto the high ground they march. 33 drops a little bit low from the Soul Catcher, but Infamous can't really push forward. That ace speed bow is just so terrifying and he's so tanky. Now they've got to pick off Schofield. It's going to be tossed back for the telekinesis into all the meepos. And even as they take the damage, they just keep on moving forward. Whisper thinks they're a little bit low enough. Maybe commit. And that's certainly where this Phantom Lancer is going in. But he has to doppelganger away with Sliver of HP. He's going to be caught. Shot down by the Ethereal Blade. Now turning in with a Scythe of Ice. Going to be able to go for Schofield on his second life. No dieback for him. And Whisper, well, he can't even finish off one meepo. During that same game, Meepo's global map presence was very visible. As NIP were going for an early base push, the opposing Broodmother took that as an opportunity to break down the Radiance offlane tier 2 tower. With an entire map of distance between himself and Broodmother, Meepo teleported in one Meepo, then patiently waited for an opportunity and instantly nuked her down as soon as it presented itself. At no point leading up to the kill did he have to stop applying base pressure. Even minor elements like purchasing items from the secret shop were much more convenient for Meepo as he only had to move Meepo Prime into position and he could easily teleport him back as soon as he was done. His item build was still very much designed around giving him as many stats as possible as quickly as possible. Stacking 4 Wraith Bands was very common. From here, Meepo went for what we had seen before. E-Blade, Blink Dagger, Ioscardi, Hex. Manta style had fallen out of favor. I'm sorry to say that I don't know why. The item hadn't been nerfed and it should still have been good. Sometimes the metagame is decided by player preference and I think that's what happened here. Meepo only used one new item and that was Silver Edge as a Blink Dagger alternative. This stat-heavy item build made Meepo powerful very quickly and he leveraged that into early tower pushes. 
These kinds of pushes were very valuable as they opened up the map for his team and gave them significantly increased access to farming space. That combined with Meepo's overwhelming power after he got farmed made him an incredibly dangerous hero. Meepo even gave Carry Io its only loss of the tournament and Team Liquid took Meepo to the grand finals where he won them game 1 and then was banned for the rest of the best of 5. Meepo's only real downsides were some bad hero matchups like Earthshaker who exploited his multitudinous and that he was extremely hard to play. The International 2019 was the year that Meepo struck fear into the competitive scene. Not only was he strong from a balance perspective, but his player representation was better than ever before. Meepo's power was widely respected by all teams and his results showed this respect was well deserved. While Meepo was only picked in 7 games, he boasted a staggering 71% win rate and he always performed exceptionally well. Because of this, he was banned 21 times. The only reason why Meepo didn't see more play was that there simply weren't enough Meepo players. The hero himself was nothing short of a menace. Before we talk about the changes post TI9, I would like to break our format slightly and first tell you about how Meepo performed at the International 10 and 11. Meepo went unpicked and unbanned at both tournaments. As you might already expect, the patch notes don't tell the full story here. But Meepo did go through a large variety of changes. Divided We Stand had its experience sharing reduced and its level requirement increased. These changes were brutal. Having to wait a whole additional level just for the first clone to show up crushed Meepo's laning power and slowed down his farming significantly. We saw before how lowering his level requirements made Meepo viable. Moving into the opposite direction after 8 years of power creep was simply not something Meepo could deal with. These two changes almost seemed to be designed to kill Meepo's viability. And that they did. He also gained a new Aghanim Scepter effect that gave Meepo Prime and all of his clones the Dig ability. Dig allowed a Meepo to first channel for a short moment, after which he would dig himself into the ground, becoming invulnerable and untargetable, while restoring 25% of his maximum health. Dig wasn't particularly good, but it opened up the plus mon divided we stand clone ability to be moved elsewhere, which ended up being Meepo's level 25 talent. As Meepo still leveled up much quicker than other heroes, he could consistently reach this talent and get good use out of it. Meepo also gained an Aghanim's Shard, which gave Ransack a 30% chance to apply Geo Strike. This wasn't particularly useful. A 30% chance was too low for an effect that had always been somewhat redundant on Meepo, since Earthbind served a similar purpose of locking opponents down. Within only one patch, Meepo's Shard was reworked and now allowed Meepo to poof to allied heroes within a 2000 range instead. One patch later, the Shard was reworked again. This time it allowed any Meepo to fling any other nearby Meepos at a target within 900 range, dealing 100 damage and applying a brief slow. While this was a mobility tool, it wasn't better or significantly cheaper or easier to get than Blink Dagger, so it ultimately served little purpose. Around this time, Poof was changed to Pure Damage. Pure Damage is a very powerful mechanic and it seems in an attempt to stifle Meepo before he took over the world, Valve also nerfed his already terrible attributes. Then TI-10 happened and Meepo saw no play. Afterwards, Valve decided to give Meepo some actual stat growth. His attributes still weren't outstanding, but at least they weren't the worst in the game anymore. Divided We Stand also received some more attention. Meepo no longer shared bonus attributes from Power Threats, Talents and the bonus attributes ability twice with his clones, but it now passively granted a small bit of magic resistance. Valve also absolutely insisted that Dig was the future of Meepo, constantly playing with the numbers of the ability. It had its cooldown and healing increased and then decreased again, its channel time removed and its mana costs adjusted. There were also a couple of other minor changes to Meepo's abilities and then some bigger ones to the items that he liked to use. In particular, E-Blade was changed to no longer be an agility-based item, but ultimately, none of that mattered. 
Meepo saw no play either way. But neither did we who didn't play at TI-10 or 11. Ace didn't play at TI-10 and performed poorly at TI-11, while Abed played at both tournaments but also performed poorly. Meepo needed an MVP to pilot him, but none were available. Teams that already struggled to perform were particularly inclined to then take their chances picking a risky hero like Meepo. There's no hero more closely tied to his players than Meepo. By far the most difficult hero to play in all of Dota. Achieving mastery with Meepo is a holy grail that most deemed not worth pursuing. But the handful of players that did struck terror into their opponents. Sing Sing came first and laid the foundation, then Abed, V and Ace took over as the defenders of Meepo. In their hands, Meepo shined. When given his chance, no other hero dominated the map as hard or farmed as quickly as Meepo could. He moved so efficiently that one of his biggest problems was taking too much farm from his team. This was especially impactful if it came to experience as Meepo's unique experience sharing mechanics left his team starving. Meepo was powerful but also risky. And most importantly, Meepo was hard to play. Only a handful of individuals ever dared to try him at the international. Those players were widely respected and rightfully so as they could win games all by themselves. Overall, Meepo has the second highest all-time win rate of any hero and an outlandish pick-to-ban ratio of 1 to 3.5. That leaves the question. How good was Meepo? Statistically, he has been one of the worst heroes of all time. But that doesn't tell the full story. A hero can't be the worst and at the same time be constantly banned as soon as somebody is good with him. In Dota 2's history, Meepo has been an anomaly. An anomaly that performed better than I could have ever imagined. And I'm certain that as soon as someone obsessively practices the hero again, and makes it to the biggest stage, we will see Meepo's triumphant return. Thank you very much for watching the story of Meepo. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to check out this sponsor and don't forget to consider becoming a channel member. That's really the best way to support us. I gotta say, I was really surprised by how how good Meepo actually was. I went into this video thinking he wasn't gonna be that impressive. He was gonna have just a couple of wins, but mostly, you know, because of good luck. But no, Meepo was a genuine menace for quite a few tournaments. There just weren't really any Meepo players. Bit weird, bit unique, but I think it does also make sense, doesn't it? It seems about right. That's just kind of what you would expect from Meepo. He is the kind of hero where you would think that, hey, maybe maybe people just don't want to play him, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I gotta say, I'm staying, I'm staying away from Meepo. I'm not playing any Meepo. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And I hope you're ready for the next one, which is going to be Phantom Assassin. I'll see you then.